It's made up of a couple different components. It's a suite of components. Uh, the first one is election event designer. Um, that's really the core election management system. That's where you define your geopolitical entities, contest candidates, um, and styling the ballots, and provisioning all of the machines that are fielded for election day. Again, for, uh, for in-person voting, um, it's image cast X. The X is because it's configurable. There's two different implementations here. On this side is the ImageCast VVPAT, which stands for Voter Verified Paper Audit Trail. All right. So uh, the voting interface is the same between the two. Um, the big difference is, is once a ballot is cast uh, on the ImageCast VVPAT, the official record is printed here on a reel-to-reel -reel thermal printer. Right? The voter verifies the record that's printed, um, and then when they hit cast, the results are stored uh, directly on this. How, how long is the thermal print? Uh, it uh, the we have archival paper that's uh, that exceeds all statutory requirements. I think it's good for about five years. Statutory requirements are generally twenty four months. Cost of the paper and how many prints from the roll? Uh, the roll, uh, depending on the ballot content, um, anywhere from one hundred to two hundred per roll. And the cost of the roll? Uh, I, I don't talk uh, dollars and cents, I'm just a tech guy, so um, <laughs> John will have to get you that information. And that's part of the contract. Ten, ten dollars. A roll. Key I'll, thing is, I'll verify is, that for you, sir. Key thing is, at the end of the day, um, uh, no matter what the configuration is, the official record is the paper, right? That is what the voter verifies. Um, and uh, unlike uh, previous legacy systems that had VVPATs, um, we actually have a scanner in here, so the record is being printed and scanned and interpreted just like uh, a separate tabulator is used, okay? Um, Where does the paper go? It stays in here. Is it on a roll? Yes, it's on a roll. Does it get separated? No. Why has that changed from last time? That's the reason they didn't approve them last time. Uh, that's not technically true. Um, there have been some discussions with the state. You're talking about voter privacy and being able to backtrack. Um, in this configuration, you always have more than one unit. Um, and at the federal level and at the state level, they have accepted that uh, the randomization of sending voters to different machines um, does prefer, preserve voter uh, anonymity. So our machines then are technically okay that we have now. We just have that paper. You'd have to take that up with the state. I'm not sure about that because the system that you have right now would never pass federal certification. Um, this is compliant with the latest VDSG 1.1 standards, where your current uh, your current system, even if it had a paper uh, record, would not uh, meet those certification requirements. Okay, Commissioner, um, sure that's a four dollar paper roll. Four dollars. The other implementation, again, same voter interface. Uh, it's the ImageCast BMD that stands for Ballot Marking Device. Um, again, it's the same process. Voter goes up, makes their uh, selections, but at the end what they get is instead of the record printing out, um, instead of printing out on a, on a real reel, um, you actually get a physical piece of paper that then is scanned on a separate tabulator. Right, so uh, the device, um, again, it's a standard uh, touchscreen interface, but it's modern. Uh, it's high contrast, high clarity. Um, you do not have anything like, uh, you never have to calibrate the screen. It's just like your phone. Um, you have full control over things like language at any point in the ballot. Also text size, you can change um, if you're a, a low visual acuity, as well as contrast levels. So you can go to black on white or white on black. These are all in uh, support of uh, the uh, VDSG guidelines, voter uh, voluntary voter system guidelines um, for accessibility. Uh, it is uh, fully ADA compliant as well with a handset and audio feedback. Um, it does support uh, two switch paddles and sip and puff as well as our proprietary ATI audio tactile interface. So, um, again, I'm going to go back to English. My Spanish is not very good these days. Um, basic uh, navigation throughout the ballot. Voter selects anywhere within a given uh, choice, and that's selected. It does prevent voters from overvoting, which is one of the nice things about a touchscreen interface. If I want to modify it, I deselect and select my other option. Uh, does have write-ins with full keyboard support. Right. 
and we can just move through the ballot. This is a vote for three. There is a final review before printing anything, and again, the interface is identical between the two. Right? It's just the, the, the form of the final record is different. So once I verify, I simply hit print. And this is what the voter gets. All right? And this is a, a reduced ballot. It shows for every contest the choices that were made. If I skipped any contest, it would clearly indicate that no selection was made for that. Um, at this point, this ballot has not been cashed yet. Right? The voter reviews this, verifies that it's the choices that they intended to make, and then it is scanned on our image cast precinct tabulator. Okay. Whether it's being scanned here or internally scanned here, we're taking an image of the ballot and we're appending what's called the audit mark which is a text-based record of how the tabulator actually interpreted the ballot when it was scanned. And we keep that together with all of the records throughout the entire process. Um, that was instrumental um, in our implementation in Colorado. They adopted a uh, statewide statute um, for conducting what's called a risk limiting audit, which is a statistical auditing method. Um, it's kind of all the rage in the election community these days. Um, and it requires that you have a one-to-one -one ballot record from the paper to the electronic record, and our audit mark was instrumental in, in <coughs> implementing that. Okay. Um, at the end of the, uh, the day, um, if it's in this configuration, all of the results are stored on here. Poll workers will close the polls. You get a results tape that shows all of the um, ballots uh, totals that were cast in the precinct. And behind these locked and sealed doors are compact flash memory elements. You would pull one of those out. Um, put it in the transfer case, send it down to the central office for tallying and accumulation. Okay. If you're in this configuration, behind uh, one of these lock sealed doors are uh, a USB memory device, that's where we store the results. We would pull that out, send that down to the central office and tally and accumulate off of that. And the results reports um, can be printed directly on here and posted. So if you have 10 machines, you're going to have 10? Yes, yeah, so we can consolidate in the precinct for a consolidated precinct. But you will have 10 memory agents. Yes. To carry in. Yes. That's our in person solution. Um, one other uh, thing to mention this is a full hybrid support, too. So, obviously, um, for ADA requirements, uh, this is the device or this is the device we use. But you can also uh, have standard hand marked ballots as well if you want to go uh, a traditional full paper route for most of your voters. Um, the device, regardless, that's the wrong precinct again. <coughs> for the people that were here earlier, I'm, I'm learning. <laughs> Best thing yet. Yeah. That image cast precinct is the most used optical scanner uh, actually in the world. Over 100,000 deployed. How much are those, um, those papers that printed and all that cost of paper and all that? That's a great question. We don't do uh, printing. We, we work with a third party here in the state, and that's something that Michael currently uses William Penn printing, correct? Well, we don't have paper balance right now. Yeah, like, for your absentees, possibly? Oh, we do everything. You do in house? Okay. I can get those figures for you from the third party. I will say that, um, again, our ballot format is, is um, uh, it is a very, let's, I, I don't want to say less tolerant, but the, the tolerance requirements on our ballot are not very tight. So old uh, paper ballots, required uh, heavy paper cardstock, um, offset printing, uh, very expensive heavyweight paper. This is standard. Uh, we, we support 80 to 100 pound text paper. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot less expensive than cardstock. And these are suitable for printing on digital presses. Right? And even on um, Oki data uh, based laser printers if you were doing um, in-house printing. Right? So my point here is that even in this system, if this was your ADA and you really wanted to go to a more traditional paper-based hand-marked ballot system, the same tabulator can scan both ballot formats. Right? There's no configuration option that has to be changed, so you could actually have a mix of voters voting on hand-marked and on the ICX as well. So that's our in-precinct. Um, this uh, is our uh, absentee central count um, back office scanner. Again, off the shelf, it's a Canon scanner. Uh, it'll do about 3,500 to 4,000 ballots an hour. Um, 
It's the same basic software that runs all of our other equipment. We take an image of the front and back. We append the audit mark. All of those results are transferred directly to our results and tally reporting system. How much? For the ICE ImageCast Central G1130, everything you see here is 25,000. Software, scanner, back end, we call it a kit. <coughs> and you'll understand why once I break down furthermore with the, the numbers. We also have another option. A smaller scanner, same exact capability, but you put less ballots in. That's called our M160, and that is $7,500. Just want to point out, in the middle of that stack was another ballot format that's uh, been through the ringer. Um, that's the beauty of these Canon scanners. Um, I can, and when you're dealing with absentee ballots, you'll get them back in all sorts of uh, states of disrepair. Um, these scanners are very good at paper handling. and. If I bring up that image, um, you, you'd be hard pressed to tell it was ever wrinkled. Yes, sir, question. It's more technical question. You said there's two hard drives, locked hard drives. Yeah. One now. And one goes back to the office. Yes. And the other one goes to the minority inspector. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it follows whatever state requirements. What's required to get the information off of that for it to be reviewed by other than the main office? Um, to read the results off the cartridge, um, you do need a cartridge reader uh, system for doing that. It would have to come back. Yeah. That, that's where, just like the PEBs now, that, that's basically well, what they're really like the PEBs now. Is it proprietary? Yeah, well, uh, it's not a proprietary memory element. It's off-the-shelf compact flash um, for the ImageCast precinct. It's standard USB um, for the ImageCast X VBPAT. Right. To read it, is it proprietary? Yes, it is. It's our software. So there's a couple <laughs> things there. For, um, for security, all the results are encrypted and signed. Right? So we can guarantee the integrity of the results. Right? So you would need the encryption keys to decrypt that. Um, the images are not encrypted, um, so those are publicly viewable, um, and they're standard uh, TIFF format. So most states that we've actually implemented in, um, they actually make all of the PDF or the TIFF images of the ballots uh, publicly available. I see you have a battery sitting there. What's the battery like? Um, in, in this configuration, in the VDPAT, uh, a single battery is good for about two and a half hours of continuous operation. Um, the requirement is two hours. It does have two bays, um, and they're hot swappable, so you can have up to five hours uninterrupted, um, and then you can swap batteries if needed. What's the weight of that piece of equipment? Uh, this is 22 pounds. And this, how much weight is on that other one? Uh, this is, I don't know, right offhand, uh, I'm going to guess about four and a half pounds. Four and a half pounds. Four and a half pounds. And then... Um, the durability, I mean, it's a big screen. How many have cracked, uh, dropped, and uh, it looks like they could tip off the table. Yeah, well, um, I am not aware of any field breakage at this point. And again, this goes back to our first uh, implementation in 2015, including 5,000 units that were used two weeks ago. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, field breakage, and I was on site in Clark County, which, um, yeah, none of them came back broken. Uh, I will say that, again, this is uh, an off-the-shelf unit from a company called A-Value. Um, they generally do applications in uh, hospitals, uh, specifically crash carts. So they're, um, they're used to making pretty robust devices. Yes, if I pick this up above my head and throw it on the ground, it's probably good. You know, I've been thinking about these off-the-shelf parts um, as opposed to proprietary. And I, I want to ask the question, what happens if one of your suppliers goes bankrupt or for some other reason gets bought out to a competitor, right. whatever it might be? What happens to serviceability, so, et cetera? Yeah, so we have very close relationship with all of our vendors. Um, so with A-Value, uh, we have a guaranteed contracted lifetime of units available for 10 years and parts availability for 20 years, all right? All of our other components, Canon, we have a similar relationship with Canon. 
um, where they've guaranteed us a certain lifetime window, and they keep us informed if any of their components are going end of life, and we can get those recertified. Because they're off-the-shelf components, getting de minimis, what's called a de minimis change certification is very easy at the federal level, and from our conversations with the state, they're adopting a similar process. Right? So um, all of our computers are Dell-based, and we have the same kind of relationship with Dell. So they know what our parts list are, um, and when they have a unit that looks like it's going to be going end of life, they let us know six to 12 months ahead of time, and then they work with us to identify the replacement uh, unit, and then we submit that to all of the certification authorities, and they generally turn that around now in one to two weeks. But again, these are companies, this is what they do, so they have much better relationship with their parts vendors for actually you know, manufacturing these units. We're a voting company, we make voting software, right? We don't build uh, equipment, right? We let somebody else, that's their main relationship. They've got their factories, they've got their suppliers, and then we work with them in a very close collaboration to make sure that they can meet our requirements as far as uh, parts and lifetime. Okay, I see you have two sets of plastic cards up there. Two sets of plastic cards. These, yep. yeah. One says voter. Yep. And one says poll worker. Poll, poll worker. Okay. Yeah. Um, how many in a primary where we have usually two major parties or sometimes three parties and you're only allowed to cast for your party. Yep. And we have independents who can cast for other things. Mm -hmm. How many sets of cards do we need? What do you know how much that costs? Yeah, so uh, Mike and I were talking about that. So there's there's a couple or different ways. Or do we need different? Do you need different? Yeah. So for every part? It, it really it really depends on on, on the implementation um, that Lebanon goes with. So right now the poll worker is the main access to the device. All right, and it's it's basically it's called two factor authentication. A poll worker can't do anything without this card and a unique pin. But one of the things they can also do, much like your current process is I can activate the ballot as a poll worker for the voter directly so that they don't require a card at all, right? Poll workers can control that. If you go through an actual voter card itself, again, it depends on the implementation, um, but generally you have an activation station, so you only need uh, generally five to 10, it depends on the number of machines, but five to 10 per precinct and they can be reused and reprogrammed for each voter. So as they come in and get checked off, oh, you're a Republican voter in precinct two, this card is programmed for that corresponding ballot. When you put it in the machine, it will bring up the correct ballot. Once the ballot's cast, this card is invalidated, can't be used again until it's reprogrammed. Costs uh, $8 with the encryption. Now, each kit, as we call them, so you see the group of configuration, they come with five apiece. So really, you do not even need to purchase these individually. However, I would recommend it when I do put it, because just like anything else, we're going to be They're somewhat consumable. So, so the, the clerks are going to have to re reprogram? It, it depends on the configuration. They, they have their system set up, and I know this because we had this conversation. They have their system set up so different, different uh, jurisdictions can do it different ways. But one of the ways that they can do it is you could have a poll worker that basically would have the card that would basically um, start the session. Similar to what we have now with a machine operator that has a PEB that would start the session. And I'm assuming you can you can program that card yes. to be whatever it would need to be. Yes. So it would be a Democrat or Republican if it's Correct. in the primary or the Correct. Correct. We're still going to have one little blue thing. Yeah, yes. Well, that's a little bit different because that lets them know what kind of ballot style it is, and, and well, so that would be something ballpark, we would have to deal with. But yeah, but they, they have the capability of doing it different ways because they even have the ability to um, have it hooked up to a poll book. They don't sell poll books. That's why there's not one here, electronic poll books. But they have the capability with those cards that you could have a vendor come in with an electronic poll book that would then you they would you in connect in conjunction yeah. with their cards then would, would have that information on it and then the, the actual person would put that card in and it would have their information as far as being able to say what ballot they need. Am I, am I being wrong on anything? No, that's absolutely This is a correct. conversation yeah. Jack and I had, yeah. that's why I'm trying to explain it to Yeah, so, so we work with, with several different poll book manufacturers. Um, so No Ink, Votech, um, uh, 10X, well, that, 10X. That, that's not a problem in this county. 
Right, but I'm just I saying we have but, the capability. So there's yeah, different looking, ways you can Looking do it. forward down the road, <laughs> um, we have integrated with those and we we work closely with them. So if the county ever went in that direction. Uh, my question is two, maybe three parts. Let's see. But, uh, <laughs> you had a slide up there where Michigan was a, is a big user of Dominion, right? Do you have any knowledge of the breakdown of how many went with Either Michigan was all this configuration only. Okay. All right. Nevada was only this configuration. Okay. Um, Colorado was half of this. It was this for the in-person voting, but instead of scanning, uh, because they do mostly vote by mail, and, and uh, then they have vote centers for early vote and election day. So instead of actually scanning, they would just put it in a dummy ballot box, and everything was brought back to the central office and scanned oh. here. So um, are those configurations interchangeable yes that they are okay. yes so then my third part of the question is if let's just say what how did you differentiate that what are you calling them uh, uh, ICX VVPAT okay and ICX BMD okay PAT BMD yeah okay Pat and <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, it is do you offer a scenario or a contract where one is selected and you want to migrate yeah. at some point yes yeah. and and um so does that happen obviously it can happen yeah does it's that. never happened but i could foresee it potentially happening um yeah yes i can so to answer that question even in tennessee there's been discussions that's another state that i handle they are very late to the game in the paper trail aspect. They just want just the touch screen. It's a direct record electronic device. Uh -huh. John, a couple years from now, can I just buy the VV pad? Yeah, that, the, the whole idea of the system is to have interchangeable parts. So to answer your question contractually, if you didn't like that setup, and let's just say we screwed up, we like the VV pad better, you plug and play. Okay. And we can we can I mean, work there'd have to be some negotiation. Exactly. And then voting, or whatever, and voting right. reform laws too, and that's the other part. So the, the off-the-shelf equipment helps. We're having very serious talks in this state about voting reform laws. Let's just say you go to vote centers and you shut down, just throwing it out there, I don't know, five precincts. So you have 55, you're down to 50, you don't need as many parts and pieces, we pull that back. Again, off the shelf, or if you want to add or you want to have more paper-based, okay. that's how you want to do it. We, okay. we have well, the capability so to do There's a lot of flexibility with the interchangeability Correct. and even changing between the different. Yeah, again, because the whole point is it's the same voter interface yep. it's the same platform it it literally is a configuration option um, in the definition of the machine okay jumping to adjudication yep we're, we're starting the beginning i can go to the end um the one with the thermal printer yes what is actually on the roll is it just a little square or does it have all the names no, it has all it, it has all of the choices and the contest names associated okay, with it. The little square is just for for ease of, of the computer reading. Yeah, and it also has security information. So this is what comes out of the uh, the BMD, and that's exactly the same format that's written on the thermal printer as well. Okay. So they're identical. So we can just yeah put it on a put it on a reader. And yes. An old micro fish machine type. Pretty much. Yeah. Because oh, I can't. Even with my best glasses, I don't think I can read that small stuff. What's the life expectancy of your machine? Uh, minimum 10 years. What's the maximum? Uh, more than 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> so we had, like Eric had mentioned, manufacturer guaranteed to make a 10 plus. It doesn't mean it can't last in years 15, 16, 17, depending on how long you need them. Systems won't be certified yet. Yeah, I mean, it depends. There are certainly systems out there far in, in excess of 10 years, right, that are still considered certified, but that landscape's changing a bit. But again, the, the, the whole point is we're really trying to focus on the software itself. Um, you know, these are, the, the tablets are Android-based. Android's not going away. It <coughs> comes out with updates, but we adapt to those, right? Our back-end systems are all Windows-based, but they're on the latest um, versions of software. Uh, in addition, as I mentioned, that we, we get end-of-life components, software becomes end-of-life, and we have a process for updating that. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of systems, legacy systems out there that are still running, if you're lucky, on Windows XP. Um, not too long ago, there were still systems running on DOS, right? Um, and they did not have the capability of updating to anything uh, newer than that. 
Right? Uh, what we're bringing into the state is all on the latest versions of, of Windows Operating Systems Server 2016, SQL Server 2016 as well. Right? And we update that on a regular basis and redo all of our certifications appropriately. So um, to kind of wrap this up, I did want to go through this briefly to show a couple concepts. This is, uh, and this is a big change for the county as you go to a, a paper-based system, is that you have things like voter intent issues where voters are not always very good at reading directions and following directions when filling out ballots, um, and that can lead to issues like shown on the screen. So this is an actual ballot that's been scanned um, on the ICC, the ImageCast Central. Um, this is the front of the ballot. I can zoom in and out, and I'll just hide these overlays. Uh, this is a pretty common thing that you see um, when you have paper ballots, even uh, you know absentee, but even in precinct, Somebody makes a mark, they don't want to go down to the elections office to get a, a new ballot, so they scratch it out, they make a little note. When this ballot gets scanned, if we look at the audit mark, because again, this is our patented record of how the ballot was interpreted when it was scanned, you can see it's being counted as an overvote right now, right? Because it's got marks, identifiable marks for two candidates and a vote for one. But with our adjudication system, in the past, um, Jurisdictions would have to actually duplicate, physically duplicate this ballot onto a new ballot and rescan it and retabulate it. Our system, we can do everything digitally. So I can go here and I can simply make a selection, vote removed for choice Howard Hughes. And if I complete that, that ballot is no longer an overvote. It's now a vote for the intended candidate. It moves on to the next ballot that needs to be addressed. And I can show you what happens. I go back here, I open up that ballot again. Here's the audit mark. Now there's an appended record that shows that a mark was removed uh, for Howard Hughes, and now it is a valid vote for Amelia Earhart. Right? That's the kind of transparency and auditability that our system has and nobody else does. And that is tracked uh, date and time stamped. Um, I'm currently, this is the user I'm logged in as, so you can assign unique users to adjudication teams. So you have a guaranteed record, not only of how the ballot was cast and, and interpreted originally, but any adjudications made to it. And we have a whole uh, secondary system called our ballot audit and review module um, that allows you to post-process these images and records um, for audits and, and uh, various other canvas related activities. Any questions on that? And then obviously uh, no system is complete uh, without a tally and reporting system. Um, that's what we have here. All right, so uh, this is where the data uh, eventually ends up. Um, and then we have a, a variety of reports, state level exports, um, extracts, canvas reports. Uh, we can slice and dice at various um, uh, levels, you know, if you want to separate out your early voting from your absentee totals, from your election day totals, um, if you want to look at things by district or by precinct, um, we have all of those capabilities as well. Is that user amendable for reports? Um, there is some slight customization, um, but generally, uh, you know, we, we've, we've added um, what we think are, based on our experience and our customer feedback, um, there are a lot of different options, but it is not sort of an ad hoc reporting system. So uh, we handle most of that with um, actual exports that can then be post-processed and consumed with other, with other reporting products. Um, and we do have the ability to uh, provide new exports. Ex export to what? Um, we do a variety, uh, CSV, XML, JSON. So it depends on the application. So uh, that's it for kind of Eric's portion. Uh, thank you, Pete. Uh, adjudication is the last end of the back end things for the central scanning. And I know we have probably five more minutes before we can field any questions and have the commissioners want to come. Again, we wanted to swiftly go through this, a lot of information. So um, again, appreciate your attention and time. Um, we have ImageCast Remote and Yukava integrated with our system.
We also have mobile ballot printing, so printing on demand. So to answer your question, uh, Mike, we do have three different levels, actually. Um, Okie data printers, uh, 300 series, 700 series, and 900 series. You're able to print ballots here. We've gotten a little bit into that, so keep going. Audit the ballot. We've got a little bit into that. We have a dual threshold technology. Ian, if you wanted to step in and mention this. Uh, yeah, really. I mean, this again, this is one of those those, those technical um, issues. Again, having not really dealt with a lot of paper in the past um, in this county, when, you, when you're dealing with paper, um, you know, you're counting pixels, essentially, um, within the oval, right? And just because scanners tend to scan slightly differently from scanner to scanner, from day to day, you get smudges, whatever. Um, old optical mark uh, recognition systems had a single threshold. So anything below was definitely not a vote. Anything above was a vote. The problem is if you have a mark that's right on uh, that threshold. Scanning it multiple times, you can get different results. So what we've done is instead of having a single uh, threshold level, we have a dual threshold level. So we have a lower bound. Anything below the lower bound is not a vote. Anything above the upper bound is a vote. And anything in between is what we call an ambiguous or marginal mark. Right? How we use that is in person voting, the, the tabulator will actually not accept a ballot with a, a marginal mark. So it forces the voter, because they're standing right there, to make their intent clear. So we try to eliminate that issue of results changing in any kind of recounts because you've got a mark right in, in the, that, um, that single threshold. Absentee ballots, obviously, we don't have the voter there, so we don't have direct control. But anything with a marginal mark is also sent to adjudication. So you can look at things like, is the mark consistent? Um, is it a hesitation mark? And then you can make that determination on what the voter's intent was. What's the minimal uh, pixel number for uh, So it's, con it's configurable. Um, so generally, most of our accounts are choosing um, anywhere between 5 and 10 for the lower bound, um, and about 25 for the upper bound. Okay. So, you know, the lower it is, the more you're going to have to look at. But again, with our digital adjudication system, that process is very easy and efficient. So they'd rather look at more ballots to guarantee that full voter intent is being applied. Thank you. Um, the cost for your um, ImageCast X. The image, which so just the actual <coughs> touch screen itself, roughly $2,700. And can you tell me then the difference in price between the two scanners? They're, they're the same. So this is $3,500. This is $3,500. Oh, $3,500. Correct. And I will go, and I have a quote, depending upon which one you want me to quote, I will have it ready for you. And also we are, we are applying a 25 to 30% discount. I'll mention this at the end too. Hopefully commissioners will be happy to hear. Um, I'll get into that more later on. But those were just list pricings that I gave. So. Um, service and support. Yeah, I'm going back. You're okay. You got it. Here we go. So the last last thing I want to mention, uh, Eric, thanks again for some, a couple of our core technologies. Um, one quick anecdote on the audit mark. I found this out. We just had a uh, we just had a recount. Uh, I forget the, I forget the county in California. Um, uh, attempted recount. One of the candidates, uh, I think it was very small margin, uh, I think like a hundred some votes were the separate, maybe a couple thousand, and um, <laughs> he brought his lawyers in they said, we, I want to challenge this, make sure every vote was counted. Before he paid anything, this candidate, like I said, wanted to make sure everything was right. Election official, director came in and said, you might want to check out what the meeting has called our audit mark. Sat down, went through 30 ballots, verifying each vote individually. The guy said, that's all right, I'm not going to I'm not going to contest this. I'm not going to hire a lawyer. So, real life example, real life situation of how the audit mark was used in that situation. <laughs> That's actually happened in, in multiple counties. And there we go. So, over the last couple of years, uh, it happened in a couple in um, Colorado as well, and in, in New Mexico. Um, that one has two pieces, but it also has a third one. How much is that? Um, which which third one? ICP. The idea. Oh, this one's This is this is thirty nine hundred dollars. Is that with the base? Uh, the base is a thousand. Again, we kit them together, and we will supply a discount at the end to make that. You'll be able to see it in the quote that I provide, Mike, and to my guys. So, 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 
Would you, would you, uh, is, is that they all ADA compliant or do you have to buy the special ADA compliance for the valid marking device? So they, they, they all support it. Um, so whether the kit includes the ATI or not would affect the price. Okay. So you wouldn't necessarily uh, buy 100% with, with the associated right. ADA uh, right. accessibility. You might only need one. one exactly. Right. exactly. So, but they, they can be used on any of the ICXs that are there. So again, the old way of thinking, most a lot of other vendors, I'm not sure, but I can speak to ours. We can, you can mix and match the ATI specifics. So you'll buy 55 ATI kits. So, and you can mix and match the actual touch screen with any one of them. Oftentimes with some of the old vendors with the proprietary parts and pieces, you have to have this as our ADA accessible device. Yeah. That, doesn't, that doesn't work that way with us. We wanna make sure it's seamless when you go to set it up. We have bags there, that sets up the price, makes it as easy and efficient as possible. That will go into your scoping. So transition to our service and support, we will come and scope what you currently have. So warehouse, carts, if there's stuff we can use from your previous Yes, system, whether it's a bag or something like that. We will do our best to come in. We've done a lot of great work customizing. Um, speaking of which, uh, our service and support team will come in, Washoe County, Nevada, uh, where Reno is. They wanted their logo on the side. They wanted it blue. Some counties wanted it white. You could get your Lebanon logo on it if you'd like. You could purchase the booth instead. Again, the whole idea is I will work hand in hand with you, Mike, to make sure you get the voting system in for any make sure your election looks the way it wants and a lot of the maintenance and transportation needs that you would like to meet I'll make sure that we come in and scope you out for that as well so on our team I'm obviously again I love what we have I think it, it's a it's a new way of thinking about voting technology and systems this is your fifth one in my mind our team is as is, is top-notch as they come and I want to make sure we highlight them if there's anything we said today there will be a, a learning curve and transition with the new system that's going to happen new form of thought especially when you had the paper component our idea is to make sure our team makes sure that this county has the best transition possible and we got a team that's all within like i said two three hours drive um, you can see a couple of the, the qualified people that we have we will have a full implementation support training needs um, ongoing service support on-site support um, that's all again completely negotiable mike what what you feel most comfortable with with your team with that being said this will be the very last thing I mentioned before we get into questions. How are we going to pay for this? So can, getting with keeping with the idea of flexibility, we have two ways you can purchase this system. I call it the old way, outright purchase. You pay a large upfront sum cost, and you pay your annual license and warranty fees in the years after, similar to what you do now. So you own the equipment, it's yours. Large upfront sum every year after. We also have what's called managed service. This is the second form of payment. Uh, managed service agreement, continue with the alphabet soup, MSA agreement. The best way you can sum it up is essentially a lease. We own the equipment, we lease it out to you. We take what you would pay throughout the course of that contract, throughout the eight years, six years, 10 years, and we divide that by eight, and you pay that small line item price each year. So as a commissioner standpoint, your election office will have, there's our budget line item. Let's just say, we include too much. You just want to over prepare. Four years of training, real life example in Tennessee. They actually understood the system so easily and efficiently. We refunded them the money for the three years that they were planning on paying. We put it in their bank and we never charged them. You don't get what you don't pay for in that situation and in general. But it also keeps the system from going obsolete. So if you select the managed service agreement, Within that agreement, if you want to elect, elect for system upgrades, so with any system upgrade, you'd have to retrain, program. If we make an adjustment, let's just say to the tablet, let's just say to the VV pad or to the printer, you 100% you does not allow your parts and pieces to go obsolete. You're constantly getting those updates with because we own the equipment. So if you want to elect to have that, that's a great way in years six, seven, eight to continue that trend. So those are the two flexible purchasing options. And um, I, again, I will work with Mike, depending upon how you guys want to meet, discuss. Again, we had a lot of options. Um, our job is to make sure that we get the right system for the county. And I know currently, like I said, we have, I tell this to our 11 customers, it's a big decision. It's a valuable one, it's democracy. You gotta make sure it's secure, it's protected. Make sure you go with the system I feel is best for this county. I'll do everything in my power to make sure if you come with Dominion and we're hopeful that you are, we wanna work with you. We're very passionate about what we do. 
I joke I have a kid coming in a month. I got to work for a lot, a long time. So um, <laughs> we will absolutely uh, be here for you. I'm not going anywhere, and neither is Matt, neither is Eric. So thank you again. Yes, um, I, I keep watching a little car go in there, and um, I was wondering if one of those, they're a lot smaller. It's stick it in your shirt pocket. You could walk off with it goes to the laundry, whatever, somehow somebody else gets their hands on one. Mm -hmm. Can they use that in future elections at different polls? No, absolutely not, no. No. So there's there's election specific security information. So every election gets uh, a secure key. Um, in addition, uh, the contents of these cards are encrypted. Um, so there's there's key exchange that's that's going along to actually um, obtain the information on this card. So uh, and we've had full penetrate penetration security testing done on these cards as well. Um, so we do everything we can to make those secure, but even if it does walk off, um, each election has some very unique signature data that prevents reuse. Yes, sir. You said twice that in six months you're able to bring them up to vote. So what are the training parameters for the various people working the board? So we have a couple different options. One is train the trainer. That was the one we would suggest. In the quote, I give you guys a week to train. Again, if Mike does feels that he needs more time, we can always add more time. So to answer your question, to train the folks in the pools, I would suggest a train the trainer. We found that to be the most effective. Mike has someone in this county that is ahead of the pool workers. I don't know, I know it's not a union-based uh, process there, but if someone is very, Technology, technologically savvy, they can speak the old language from the old system to the new one. We train that person and then that is how that training process would begin. Or we could come in and train, if you want to pay someone here, stay here for a week to train daily, we also have that option as well. Well, I just didn't, I just didn't know how long, you know, I mean, we have, we have machine operators. Yeah. Which right. don't always show up or we don't have enough of, um, depending on the poll. Mm -hmm. We have, we have your clerks, we have your, which have to do with some other things. But if they have to be able to program the cards or activate the cards or whatever, are we talking hours, days? No, I would say hours. It, it, if, again, it, not to say it varies, but it does, <laughs> but it does vary. <laughs> it, it varies. So if you have someone who can follow, a, we have a quick guide set up instructions that we always have with each of our systems. They could follow that and say if they missed the training day. And we have found in the previous three years of supplying the system, um, it found it to be very easy and, and effective. Again, off-the-shelf technology, we're trying to bring stuff you use every day in your everyday life to, to, to voting. So it's not proprietary. You can learn how to <laughs> operate a tablet or a printer at, at any given point. So we would use those manuals and our trainers to help you get acclimated. I think that's, unless there's any more questions, we did pretty good. I think that was a lot to yeah. go over. Um, again, uh, you, have, you have my card there. There's a lot of the information in our packets. Um, thank you again. Anytime you want to get a hold of me, Mike, we'll work on some things. Now that this is, fun, I guess, where the last hurrah for presentations goes. So if you would like to come up and, and I get a call, play around with it. If you want to try to use some of the systems, please let me know and give me a call if you have any questions. Thank you again for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. Thank you, John.